Are we live now? Yes, seems to be. Yes. How loud? Just one second. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online education webinars. We would like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise with all, especially in such challenging times. We wish all of you a healthy and safe days ahead, and we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, which might be at times unstable. Please bear with us for any issues with the internet. All in information and academics discussed in the webinar are sourced by the speakers from reliable sources however please use the information provided in the webinar only after confirming with standard teaching the opinions in webinar are for academic purposes only and not a substitute to evidence the speakers neither the portal is responsible for any untoward events caused due to information presented in the webinar i thank you everyone and i hand over the proceedings to our course chairman for today dr hemant kalyan Hello and good afternoon and very welcome to this session on proximal humerus this afternoon. So we have uh, five shoulder surgeons with us uh, today uh, and we're going to start from the basics with classification and diagnosis, get on to the biological preserving, preserving uh, minimally invasive techniques, then the vexed problem of osteoporotic fractures in the elderly and how to tackle them. Then the exciting world of new biomaterials with PEAK. And finally, a roundup with some uh, very interesting cases, which I'm going to uh, leave it to Dr. Ravi, and that will be very stimulating at the end. And then I'll wrap up with some uh, concluding remarks and takeaways from the whole presentation. So the idea is to start on time and end on time. We've started on time. And I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Sushal. Dr. Sushal is a shoulder surgeon from uh, the institution that I belong to, doc, that is Manipal Hospital in Bangalore. And uh, he's going to be talking about the classification of proximal humeral fractures and making the accurate diagnosis. Over to Sushal. Neeraj, could you share the, give Sushal the presenting rights, please? So, yeah, hello. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, hope I'm audible. Neeraj, am I? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so warm good afternoon to all my co-speakers here and all the listeners. So it's not easy on a Sunday afternoon to tune in. So hope to make the best out of it. I promise I'll try to keep the humorous, a little bit humorous. So let's start. Uh, I've been asked to talk about classification and some diagnostic tips how to go about treating individual fractures. So, yeah. Uh, what is proximal humerus fractures? These are those fractures which occur at or at proximal to the surgical neck. They account for nearly 80% of all humeral fractures and 7% of all fractures in the body. Uh, typically, patients above the age of 65 years, it is the second most common fracture. And with a higher female incidence, about three is to one. And 65% of the fractures occur in patients above the age of 60 years. So the mechanism, I think all of you guys know, it's typically on a fall on an outstretched hand. In the older patients, it's more often lower energy trauma. Most of these fractures are not displaced with very good prognosis and can be treated non-surgically. Uh, the risk factors, as always, you know, osteoporosis, comorbidities, the decreased muscle tone as you get older. However, in the younger patients, uh, it is most often high energy trauma which causes the fractures. Uh, typically, there is severe soft tissue, soft tissue disruption in the younger patients other than the fractures which you see on the x-rays. So in, the, in these patients, you always require some sort of surgical intervention. Some of the rare causes include seizures and shocks uh, which can cause fractures. I cannot talk about classification without uh, one or two slides on anatomy. Uh, the proximal humerus is divided into four segments, the head, the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity, and, and the shaft. Uh, the articular segment is spherical with a curvature diameter of about 45 to 46 millimeter. 
the inclination of the head relative to the shaft is about 130 degrees and the retroversion is anywhere between 20 to 40 degrees so depending on the anatomy you know this gives us an idea you know which way the fracture fragments are displaced the greater tuberosity is pulled up posterior medially by the effect of the supra and infraspinatus tendons the lesser tuberosity is typically pulled anteriorly but this is by the subscap and the shaft is pulled anterior medially by the pectoralis major so this gives you an idea when you open up to see you know how to go about reducing the fractures and vascular supply the predominant one is the uh, anterior humeral circumflex artery uh, however off late uh, although the the proximal humerus is supplied by the anterior humeral circumflex artery the head is predominantly supplied by the posterior humeral circumflex artery so this has been shown to be uh, quite significant clinical examination as always orthopedic starts with history uh, this gives you an idea of the mechanism of injury uh, the velocity of the trauma typically there is pain and restrictions of the motion uh, movements of the shoulder Uh, bruising, uh, ecchymosis, hematoma might form after within a space of twenty-four to forty-eight hours. Look for associated injuries, especially in younger patients with high-energy trauma. They might be associated fractures of the scapula, rib fractures, cervical spine fractures, clavicular fractures. Uh, coming to neurological involvement, the brachial plexus typically is not commonly involved. However, the axillary nerve. needs to be documented especially in anterior fracture dislocation cases arterial injuries are pretty rare so coming to the x rays uh, there are a ton of x rays and ton of views i'll only concentrate on three ones uh, if you can remember these x rays then i think it will be really helpful the first one is a true apo or the grashis view the next is the nears or the scapula y view and then the axillary view so let's start with the true ap so what happens here here the x ray beam is directed perpendicular to the plane of the scapula uh, to obtain a basically true ap view how do we do that the patient is rotated about 45 degrees uh, bringing the side opposite to the injured side so typically you get a picture like this so if you can see this is a true ap view if you see here i hope my pointer is visible the anterior and the posterior glenoid are, are overlapping and then you can see the joint surface very typically very nicely so this is a true ap view the next one is the the scapula y view or the near view uh, <clears throat> in this case the affected shoulder is located against the cassette and the patient is rotated by about 60 degrees so that you know you bring the side opposite to the injured shoulder so <clears throat> typically this is the scapula y view if you can see this is the limbs of the y if you can see here typically this is the scapula y view so on this side is anterior on this side is posterior so this also helps us in case of dislocation anterior posterior dislocation and you can also see that uh, the types of the acromion which normally we use it in case of impingement the other view is the axillary view uh, in this case might not be possible in all traumatic conditions the arm is subducted to the patient supine and the x ray beam is projected from the axilla to the top of the shoulder so this is really helpful to give a view of the glenoid so any subtle fractures of the glenoid or displaced glenoid fractures can be visible so these are the three x ray views however with today's practice i think ct scan forms the bulk of the practice bulk of the investigation it allows a more detailed understanding of the fracture configuration you can look for the osteoporosis you can see whether there is any impaction of bone and also the extent of the fracture combination so ct scan with 3d reconstruction has changed the way we understand proximal humerus fractures so coming to the next mri mri is very rarely indicated in a, a trauma setting wherein there's high energy trauma involved however suppose the patient walks in with some sort of a trivial trauma you know you're probably suspecting is it a rotator cuff tear or is it any evidence of a subtle subluxation which was missed and you're looking at the labral tears so it might be helpful in confirming an undisplaced fracture in those settings and another setting where you use it is a pathological fracture so you to to see the extent of the the lesion so now let's go to classification per se some of the first systems you know they were dating back to 17th century simple classification of closed versus open it was in 1896 kosher he focused on the location of the fracture 
and divided them into supra tubercular peri tubercular infra tubercular and sub tubercular and in 1934 codman uh, is the one who actually described the present day classification which is a modification of that so he described proximal fract humeral fractures occurring on the, along the lines of the epiphyseal scars and look for the four possible fracture fragments the articular surface the humeral shaft the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity so this is what codman in 1934 he described so we can see the four different fragments the articular surface the shaft the greater and the lesser tuberosity so this held true for nearly about 1970s to 1980s that is when near entered the situation and uh, entered the picture and then he modified that he modified codman's classification and even today this is the most commonly used classification system so it's based on three things you know the anatomical relationship of the four parts the four parts including the articular surface the greater tuberosity the lesser tuberosity and the humeral shaft so interesting to note here in this classification is a part is considered displaced if only there is more than 1 cm separation or if it is angulated by more than 45 degrees so i'll i'll get into the details of that little more uh, later but this is important so it's not the number of fracture lines or the amount of fractures it is the part which is the amount of displacement the amount of displaced parts which is important here the second part is the involvement of dislocation whether there's any associated dislocation along with fractures and thirdly whether there's any articular surface involvement so this has found to have good inter observer as well as intra observer reliability so let's start with the first part the first one the one part fractures so like i said uh, the parts do not meet criteria of displacement in this in other words plain simply a one part fracture is an undisplaced fracture it does not mean that there is only one part of the bone is fractured you can have multiple fracture fragments however they are not displaced i'll just show you sample x rays these account for nearly 75% of the uh, humeral fractures so look at look at these x rays which are put up so if you look at it there's a fracture fragment of the greater tuberosity which is running here as well as there's a there's a fracture of the articular surface so you might argue you know there are three fragments but still since none of them are undisplaced it is a one part fracture so that's the key to nearest classification similarly two part fractures in this only one part is displaced uh, they might be superimposed glenohumeral dislocation uh, plus or minus these accounts for nearly uh, 20% of the humeral uh, proximal humerus fractures again so if you look at it if you look at the fracture the the, the main fracture is oblique fracture line running through the Uh, you can say the surgical neck but also you can see the plus sign there is a greater tuberosity fracture as well but it is only the the shaft or or you can say the surgical neck which is displaced so since two part fractures involve one part displaced so this is a two part fracture so shall sorry to interrupt we'll need to wrap up soon because we are uh, running out of time okay okay i'll just i'll just finish up the nearest <laughs> classification so finally coming to the three part uh, in this the two parts are displaced typically it involves one of the tuberosities on the neck the the remaining intact tuberosity produces a rotational deformity again coming to here so you can see the comminuted greater tuberosity fracture plus there is a superimposed rotational fragment so which is why these are three part fractures finally the four parts uh, all the four parts are displaced and typically here the articular surface if you look at this it's pulled laterally so with a higher risk of avl so if you see this there is associated dislocation or the articular surface is not in line or not congruent let me put it so finally the articular surface where the head might be split or it might be impacted uh, head splitting commonly it's split up into two parts impacted commonly seen in chronic dislocations so this is a typical if you see this no head split longitudinally into two parts finally the the a new a new order was added in uh, 2002 this is the valgus impaction so this is similar to the four part the only difference is the articular surface is not laterally displaced but it's it is driven down between the two tuberosities and it's in a valgus posture if you see this here so these are the two tuberosities the lesser greater the fragment is uh, driven into the articular surface then you have the ao the ota classification uh, this is based on the vascular supplies developed in the 1990s this has been found to be more complex than the near however there is no evidence that is more it is better and more reliable 
the only advantages that i can think of is only for prognostic and therapeutic purposes as you can see uh, you can go through this yourself there's no cr de definitive criteria for displacement uh, last few slides uh, risk of avn depending on your fracture so they call it the hurtles criteria so the best predictors are the short calcar segment this is known as a metaphyseal head extension if you see this uh, if you see there is a shorter calcar here while there is a longer one displaced medial hinge if the medial hinge is displaced more than 2 mm again it indicates avn and finally anatomical neck fractures have a higher incidence of avn compared to the others so if you look at the pictures here this has got a higher calcar although it is displaced three part fracture the humeral head extension is more than 9 mm so the one on the right has got a minimal extension so the one on the right has got a higher incidence of avn similarly the medial hinge if you look at on the left side the medial hinge is undisplaced but here it is displaced so right. these ones have a higher risk of avn to summarize uh, these fractures are quite common nearest classification is what has been routinely used even today uh, x rays and ct with 3d reconstruction form the routine investigation very rarely do you come across neurovascular injuries always look for signs of avn and the treatment has to be tailored individually thank you thank you sushal for uh, nicely setting the stage for the rest of the uh, program and um, i now invite our second speaker dr lokesh uh, he's been practicing the minimally invasive techniques for uh, the fracture exposure which uh, minimizes the risk to the blood supply and he's going to tell you more about it dr lokesh are you ready yeah i'm ready yes. um, please go ahead um is my screen shared uh, yes. yes it's visible okay i think uh, like that okay so uh, good afternoon everybody so um, i would like to put across uh, the best of both worlds i would say between the minimally invasive percutaneous fixations which was pretty popular in the last um, decade with uh, percutaneous pinning and a sturdy uh, stable um, mipo fixation or a, a plating fixation um, so we would like to see the best of both worlds how would it work so epidemiology dr sushal has spoken about it so in um, point to notice it's more common in females and in 65% of the fractures about uh, is seen in about patients about 60 years of age so it's more of geriatric and osteoporotic fractures so there are the modalities of treatment conservative management are done in uh, minimally displaced fractures but operative management uh, the varieties of uh, treatment include pillows plating the proximal humeral nail threaded k wire fixation hemi arthroplasty and reverse shoulder arthroplasty um, of which uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty is gaining popularity over hemi arthroplasty in the recent times a uh, threaded k wire has come in gone out and still people there are some ardent followers of threaded k wire fixation but hu proximal humeral nail has gone out of repute significantly so the mainstay of treatment appears to be the plating with a better uh, fixed angle device so the there are what are the problems of open reduction and internal fixation it's an extensive exposure there is a uh, significant bleeding that can happen there is a prolonged surgical time and the comminuted fractures come to your hand if it is too comminuted when you open up so it's like a crumbling sweet so um, the devascularizing of the fragments is an issue neurovascular injuries and the bulky deltoid especially prevents lateral retraction and we will have to erase the origin of the deltoid from uh, the clavicle in some of the cases so these are the problems of open reduction what are the problems of closed reduction closed reduction and pinning uh, it is an inadequate fixation though we can achieve good close reduction because it's the same ball and socket joint but with a different morphology compared to a hip joint the close reduction principles work as in the hip joint here but the problem with a pinning is that there is inadequate uh, fixation additional immobilization required pin tract infection pin loosening loss of reduction and migration are significant uh, entities which would actually um, do not give uh, good results especially in the older age group so what i would uh, what we will be doing here is we will be doing the close reduction we will be taking all the good things about the close reduction maneuver with the ease of reduction without devascularizing the fragments and 
uh, taking the addition of the internal fixation with without the extensive approach bleeding decreased operative time and better stabilization so uh, th these are the common directions of displacement dr sushal has already talked about it the as we all know the lesser trochan lesser tuberosity tries to go medially the greater tuberosity trends tries to go posteriorly and superiorly because of the attachment of the supra and the infra and because of the pectoralis and uh, the uh, the teres attachment and all the shaft trends to go medially so that's the direction of displacement so how do we typically position so what we are going to do here is we are going to do a closed reduction and internal fixation with a minimally invasive technique typically we usually prop the patient about 20 to 30 degrees and then um, we try to um, see to it that the cm image is seen in spite of the uh, uh, in, in 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 spite of it should not it should be over the edge of the table or we have we have to put in a separate platform so that we have to pre operatively check that the cm images are okay in the ap and the axillary positions in abduction and also um, we should be able to move the shoulder and also see that uh, the whole of the proximal humerus is visible so what uh, typically we do is two vectors at 90 degrees to each other typical similar to a hip uh, reduction two vectors image vectors at 90 degrees to each other if we can get and assess reduction then it would say that we are having a good fixation and reduction so what are the closed reduction maneuvers what do we employ it is appropriate to bring the shaft to the head so we give longitudinal traction and usually we push the uh, fragment posteriorly most of the times the shaft is anteriorly displaced we have to push it posteriorly and with the ap and the um, uh, axillary views we see that in abduction we can see two planes of uh, rotations and uh, we can see the two planes of displacement and also near and horowitz and uh, have mentioned that flexion abduction and external rotation is required why we say external rotation is because the greater tuberosity tends to go into that position because of the pull of the infraspinatus and we have to bring the head uh, the, sh uh, the, sh the shaft to that uh, if the greater tuberosity is still attached to the head so what are the closed reduction maneuvers we employ so if there is opening up like that a simple way would be to actually put in a joystick into the greater uh, tuberosity and uh, bring it back into position and this is a very simpler way of uh, putting the k wire back in place the what are the other methods method is actually putting the uh, if there is a valgus displacement we we can actually use a lever if it is valgus impacted we can use a lever at the junction we usually use i'll uh, show about what is the opening we use for doing all these things about one and a half, half inch only just at the lateral end of the acromion we use and we can use a lever or we can use a, a k wire joystick to put, put it back in place and we can reduce it in comp, more, much more complex fractures what we have to do is we have to use multiple maneuvers we disimpact we position it at 130 degrees of uh, uh, you know uh, inclination and we use a hook or a k wire again to bring the greater tuberosity down and we try to just align these three fragments together and put temporary fixing k wires either we can do it with a lever or you can do it with a k, uh, k wires so these are some of the closed reduction maneuvers we can use a, a lever to lift it up and bring it to 130 degrees of inclination and use a hook or um, even use another k wire to bring the greater tuberosity back into its place so if there is a gap in between it doesn't matter we have to just realign the fragments in such a situation that they can be fixed um, and um, usually it heals up because we are doing a biological uh, manipulation and fixation so these are uh, the x ray images Uh, wherein we actually use a lever to put the head back the head is to be brought back into its place over the shaft so typically uh, we can also do once we fix the head to the shaft we can rotate it internally and externally 45 degrees so there are also two vectors at 90 degrees to each other that will also tell us about the valgus varus and the anteroposterior displacements so that that's that that's also another way of seeing displacement if bringing the head into abduction and the sh sh shaft into abduction and adduction is tough in some of the times so these are the maneuvers we use and this is typically the incision we use proximally another one and a half inch the lower incision is usually radiologically based centered over the lower three holes the center hole we center it over there and put in a sing a one inch incision so typically we avoid the axillary nerve 
and then what do we do is we just use a periosteum to elevate from the proximal end till the uh, to the extent of the whole plate we try to elevate it mind you we are actually holding the fracture with the k wire initially after close reduction and we put in the plate and use this uh, k wire to see to it that it doesn't come proud and once we put it back in place we put the first screw we put the first screw in the head of the humerus typically is about 42 to 44 mm in length and then we do the distal opening and we put in the simple cortical screw non locking screw to actually abut the plate against the shaft of the humerus and once we are done this once these two screws are there then we can actually bring the rest of the put the rest of the screws and multiplanar fixations and the most important one is the calcar screw which is very important to prevent virus collapse so this is typical fixation and as i was mentioning once you put it we can actually take the arm through 45 degrees external rotation 45 degree internal rotation and there are two vectors at 40 90 degrees to each other we can check the adequacy of reduction so that's how okay share one more minute i I'll, i'll 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 come through Lovely. so this is one of the fixation maneuvers where we have actually tried to do only with minimally invasive fixation that's another one you can see uh, if there is valgus impaction we could bring it back in place that's another fixation all done through you can see the staples over there with minimally invasive fixations so avascular necrosis it is said that many heads revascularize after fixation so when you can't do this when you have a fracture dislocation malunion non union head split fracture severe combination then we don't do so this like typically this is a fracture dislocation we actually have to open it and fix it another fracture is gt combination we have to open it this is another head split fracture we have to open it and put it back in place we have used two screws here to actually put those two fragments back in place but typically a head split fracture deserves a arthroplasty another case of non union and uh, otherwise we, we cannot do all these things we do arthroplasty as we see in all these cases so we do, we can do hemi arthroplasty and now more and more of re reverse shoulders are picking up so in conclusion i would say that close reduction and minimally invasive osteosynthesis gives us the best of both worlds there is ease of reduction lesser operative time blood loss and sturdy fixation so we can uh, mobilize the patient he can uh, brush his teeth eat his food with his right hand if it's right hand fracture without much ado so he can do his day to day activities of course it doesn't take the load but it is good enough to actually do the job thank you so much thanks for patient listening thank you so much dr lokesh for a nice uh, expose of the minimally invasive techniques and defining the indications and where we should do it thank you um, moving on we'll have uh, dr uh, vivek pandey from uh, kmc manipal our sister institute and um, he is going to talk to us about the big problem about the osteoporotic fractures as has been already said the stage has been set by the previous two speakers and he's going to share tips and tricks about how to uh, tame those osteoporotic fractures which go all over the place dr vivek are you ready yes i am ready lovely thank you very much and i think um, a great job has already been done by uh, shushal and uh, lokesh to <clears throat> bring almost everything um, into the scenario so i just have to be very brief about what we do in proximal humerus fractures especially if there is a bit of an osteoporosis <clears throat> so these are the various challenges which my previous speakers have already you know um, enunciated that there is a lot of combination virus retroversion and now my part is to discuss a bit about the osteoporosis when we are managing the difficulty especially the type c ota type c or let's say type 3 or type 4 types of the proximal humerus fractures all these patients who are especially as uh, shoshal said their majority of them are above 60 65 they may be having an underlying osteoporosis so in these patients it is the age of the patient those who are elderly and the age of fracture so older the likely who would have in some local osteopenia would have creeped in any comorbidity prolonged illnesses can also cause osteoporosis and especially if there is a lady who is 65 70 fracture looks fixable but then you have to keep the osteopenia in mind exercise to give the question where is valgus and osteoporosis also ct remains a uh, key planning tool 
but that may not per se the regular ct will not give you the um, x ray itself if you look at it there is there are beautiful studies done uh, in the recent past there is one study by tingart et al where did they they did they did the the thickness of the proximal humerus proximal diaphysis metaphyso diaphysal junction with the dexa and uh, measured the cortical thickness in four areas you can see it's in the proximal metaphyso diaphysal area where the two uh, areas become thin on this they also gave a formula so if they said that the mean thickness let's say is about 5 or 6 mm you can multiply this and it will give you the bmd of various parts of the humerus that is the head neck tuberosity and lesser tuberosity but more or less in this surgical practice if you see it is more of you know the visual appearance i mean nobody would like to use this formula but yes we can always calculate these uh, cortical thickness to figure out how much is the osteoporosis this formula has been used extensively in the recent studies also um spiral ct the same ct what we do to find out the the type of you know the proximal humerus the displacement can also be used to figure out how much is the bone mineral density using the hounsfield unit and there's a correlation having said that the practicality of this particular formula is not much applicable hence the ct scan remains a bit back and then pe people use the clinical judgment the biochemical investigation as well as the radiological parameters to figure out is there any osteoporosis or not if you are suspecting osteoporosis it is important that one must do the pth vitamin d calcium phosphorus alkaline phosphorus and tsh and if severe osteoporosis is uh, you know uh, suspected maybe a, uh, a proper dexa scan along with other bio biochemical parameters can be done um before we start managing these porotic and comminuted and the uh, fractures these are the few questions we must answer right at the onset that am i going to fix it or replace it though my talk is predominantly about fixation but i'll still tell you that if there is ever a doubt it is always better to keep the replacement part there in the theater rather than you know you know when you open up and you find that it is not fixable the fragments are too comminuted too porotic it's like an egg shell there is no head there is no bone inside then in those cases you know uh, the putting a prosthesis which is not really wanted in this era is not nice second is is the fixation feasible what approach to my approach is not going to be the minimally invasive most of these we need a proper approach so that is the formal deltopectal approach which implant is best suited what augmentation we need for these osteoporotic fracture and after fixing fixation what is the best way to keep it very stable whether it will heal or not and lastly post stop some medicines this has already been discussed very well by location koshal so i'm not going to go into detail delto pectoral remains our standard approach i won't go into the you know the deltoid split or the lateral ones this is the standard approach once you have done that you have to put the principle is always reduce all the fragments you put the traction suture in all these tuberosity fragments uh, although various options are there but if you look at this porotic uh comminuted and porotic bone the locking plate even at the moment is one of the most preferred implant at the moment um for these three and four part fractures and fractures and dislocation these uh, implants are angle stable and the when we use the suture plate which is by arthrex it has got one of the best advantage that these you can actually tilt your screws in any direction almost 30 degree in either direction and that's why it has remained one of my corner stone in managing the proximal humerus fracture second another advantage of this plate is you can use a full thickness cancellous locking screws so in a cancellous bone you put a cancellous screw rather than you know putting a locking the cortical screw in a cancellous bone um these are various principles so once you are reducing it you see that you have got the accurate reduction of varus humeral head and uh, this uh, and the guidelines were given by snet in jbgs somebody who is interested must read this article so the varus can vary between 120 to 150 try to restore the natural version of head which may vary uh, but one can take an axillary uh, view to see accurate reduction of tuberosity with respect to head so gt should be below the head and the plate should be below the gt 
So they say GT cranialization less than five millimeters. So in this X-ray, you can see here, actually this is very accurate one. Even if it goes up, it's okay, but it should not be more than five millimeter up. One must always restore the medial buttress that is here. Uh, the head shaft displacement here, this little black arrow, what you see, it should always be less than five millimeter. And then if you find after opening that the head is porotic, head is hollow, need something for that. So this is one of the X-ray of a very comminuted porotic uh, widely displaced fracture. Uh, one can use K wires and shan spin as a reduction tool. Sometimes, rarely, we need to transfix the head with respect to the glenoid. Here you can see a shan spin has been used to just hold the head. One has to be very cautious because in porotic head, even your shan spin can tear out. And once it is the, the entire construct has been restored, the lesser tuberosity, the greater tuberosity has come in place. One can transfix for the time being with respect to the glenoid because once the head has no contact with the tuberosity that's the worst head because it will keep falling into the varus um, and once you have put one or two screws and plates here and there one can remove these this uh, wire which is transfixing the glenoid if the plate is a little bit high it can cause impingement in abduction if it is too low what will happen your calcar screw will not go into the calcar area so it should be an appropriate height and that's the reason this is screw is the key which you can actually probably you know put it in some fashion that you can slide the plate up and down um, non-absorbable sutures via the bone tendon junction not into the bone sutured the tuberosities to the plate and calcar screws are must screws what you put here they should stop about few few millimeter below um, before the subcondyl bone it is not exactly like the hip where you try to go as subcondyl as possible because head is known if there is a resorption, these screws are going to penetrate. Um, so this is how it is done with a lot of non-absorbable sutures. You can pass through these holes. Um, the restore the medial buttress, that is calcar screw. That is one of the very, very important aspect of this. Um, several studies have said, if you, you put the calcar screw, it should be within 12 millimeter of calcar. So if this is the calcar, it should be within 12 millimeter. So it means if this is screws somewhere here beyond 12 millimeter, then it is not going to serve the purpose. And the calcar ratio, calcar ratio means this distance plus the this distance. That's known as the calcar ratio. It should be within 25 percent. And the, if the calcar screw is not good or the medial support is poor, we are losing the strength by almost 53 percent. And those are the heads which will fall back into the varus. Okay, we wait, uh, we have another minute. Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. we are almost done. So there's a uh, article by Dr. J. Maheshwari where he has also uh, described the you know, medial cortico cancellous graft, which also gives a medial buttress support. Um, fibular strut graft has been used in a very standard fashion. It has been described for a long time. So once you put a this uh, the fibular strut graft, which is used usually when there's a combination of the medial cortex or the calcar. Once you have done that, you can always fix with the plate. This is one uh, video where I'm after fixing, you see this, my artery forceps is going into area which is completely hollow. So for this, there is a calcium phosphate resorbable cement, um, which is known as a quick set can be used. It gets resorbed over a few months to years. It uh, gives a very good compressive strength and a structural support. There are many studies in the in the uh, the recent past which have proved though they are all non-randomized and they the the, the number of patients what they have used is very less but still they have shown a very promising result in cases if you have a poor uh, bone and you don't want to use the fibula a small hollow you can always use this quick uh, calcium phosphate cement which is resorbable so this is how it sorry this is how it is being injected into the hollow can see here the and that will fill up the entire area and this is how it looks like when you try to move there's a little bit of semen protruding outside but since it resorbs completely so there is no harm of this the same x-ray which i showed you in the beginning nicely fixed and this is how it looks after six months only. So this lady had sent me this x in January. After that, she could not follow. So you can see a lot of cement, a lot of new bone formation, the greater dobrosity coming in healing to the rest of the shaft. These patients also need a lot of medical management. Don't just, you know, send them home. Uh, 
because they need calcium and vitamin D support. Bisphosphonates are not recommended in the early phases. If they were on the bisphosphonates because of osteoporosis, you need to stop them. Parathormone injections are recommended for first few weeks and after that you can remove this and put them back on the bisphosphonates. So for these porotic fractures, the, the key message is remember whether porotic, not porotic, whatever. The first and foremost important thing is proximal humerus fractures, accurate or you can say acceptable reduction. Always restore the medial buttress. Calcar screws, if possible, in this x-ray, you can see there's a calcar screw. If you feel that it's not real, still it's weak, one can use a fibular stud graft or a tricortical graft. Calcium phosphate cement, if the if the medial side is intact, but inside you find hollow after putting all your screws, you can put a lot of this uh, resorbable cement and medical treatment is mandatory beyond this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivek, for uh, a nice uh, presentation where you stress the importance of achieving a stable reduction, shown us the tricks of achieving uh, good fixation in difficult situations, and most importantly, the message is to treat the patient as a whole and treat the osteoporosis along with the fracture. Thank so uh, now we go on to uh, the exciting new biomaterials, uh, the peak implant. And we have uh, uh, our good friend, Dr. Uh, Ram Chidrangram from uh, Chennai, who is a present president of the Shoulder and Elbow Society of India to talk to us about the peak into the future. All yours, uh, Ram, take over. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalyan, for the great opportunity. Uh, it be a pleasure to talk about proximal femoral fracture. It's my bread and butter. Uh, let us start with the case scenario. 72-year-old lady, diabetic for 20 years, uncontrolled HbA1c 12, had a CABG five years ago, known osteoporosis, had treatment for one year, and this discontinued as typical of Indian patients. Had trigger finger surgery two weeks ago elsewhere, slip, fall, and had a displaced proximal femoral fracture. 72-year-old lady osteoporotic. So this is the X-ray and 3D CT. I think it is imperative to get a 2D CT to check the actual uh, as pointed out. And you could see the osteoporosis displacement of the head as well as the tuberosity fragment. So how do you manage this patient? Conservative, percutaneous fixation, warrior, with or with a bone graft or replace the shoulder. Uh, in this particular scenario, I chose to uh, do a locking plate fixation with bone graft to get early mobilization. And this is how I approach is this short deltopacal incision, indirect reduction using sutures. This is the key. Do not devascularize any of these fragments of the head and reduce the head fragment, cephalic fragment, provisionally fix it with the glenoid. And then I use a CR peak plate. CR means carbon reinforced. Peak as such is uh, isoelastic like bone. So it had to be carbon reinforced for strength as well as for radio, loose, radio identification. So this is the top screw fixation and the call car uh, screw, which is highlighted very uh, elegantly by Dr. Vivek. Then you see the metaphyseal void. It is a white appearance. And I have, sometimes I do anteriorly, sometimes I go through the plate hole and then use the synthetic injectable uh, substance, bone graft substitute. And that is what it looks like, reinforced with calcium sulfate uh, crystal. So this is her at uh, three months post-operative, beautiful incorporation of the uh, synthetic bone craft and the excellent range of movement. So where, how did I end up here using CRP plate? I started to use the phylos plate, a locking plate system, and it was first introduced in England in 2002. So I had been using that system for 18 years. This is the re uh, review of our first 102 patients, uh, consecutive series fixed by me as well as my uh, colleague, Dr. Daniel Mock. And this had been my technique. This has not changed over the years. A short delta buccal incision is enough. You don't need to do an extensive incision. And then uh, retract the deltoid. If you keep objective, the deltoid retraction is easier with the proper retractor. Indirect reduction, reduce the head fragment, temporarily fix it, and use multiple switches to control the tuberosity and reduce. And then you apply the plate, locking plate, and short screw. Never put long screws. That's a fixation. That's what it looks like. So that's the three principles. Number one, as elegantly demonstrated by Vivek, great tuberosity should be reduced and Kalka should be reduced and short screws because the long screw is a problem. It is not uh, hip, it is not DHS we are chasing after. And Kalka screw is very important. So this is our results, all fracture scale with no mall union or non-union, no loss of fixation. But if you look at the literature over the last uh, many uh, decades, you see a lot of complication rate and essentially screw cutout. 
These are the example of cases that presented to me, which I have devised. So this is screw penetration, as you see. And also, sometimes it is neglected. It can cause a lot of glenoid damage. So it's important in any locking plate fixation, the reduction is first, and suture em employment is a must. Do not put long screws. Do not drill deep until the subcondyl bore. The plate positioning becomes very important in a fixed angle system like a pylos. Okay? The Colcord screw is dictated by the level of the uh, positioning of your fixed angle plate. So there are changes. The new development, as uh, Vivek shown, the uh, suture plate was introduced and had been using in the 2014-15 years uh, with this. So this is the advantage of the 60 degree variable angle locking. So no longer the positioning of the plate is dictating your screw fixation or even Colcord screw fixation. Uh, now. The, this introduction of a CRP plate is on 2016. We started to uh, use. This is the carbon fiber reinforced to peak. This is again a titanium locking screw mechanism, allows a variable angle of up to 24 degrees and is a biologically inert substance with a lot of advantages. Let us see. Uh, see, this is the uh, our experience of the first 30 patients. Now I have done over 100, but this is the first 30 patients operated between November 2016 to November 2017, uh, reviewed by my fellow Mohammed Yazin. And this is the operating technique. There's no change, same technique. But the advantage is dynamic fluoroscopy screening. You could see elegantly the greater, lesser tuberosity fixation and the uh, accuracy of your reduction during the surgery. Uh, Post-op rehabilitation, I mobilized all these patients day one uh, doing assisted arm elevation exercise up to 90 degrees and the arm sling is discarded after one month progressing to full range of exercise, third month muscle strengthening exercise. So this is the outcome measured and uh, you could see uh, the average age of these patients is 53 years as you see more younger population and also the proportion of uh, uh, three part, four part fractures is around 50%. Because initially, I used selectively for the greater tuberosity fracture. Uh, then later, I got confident I was using routinely for three and four part fractures. So all fractures have healed with the mean healing time of 11 weeks. And the average constant score is 84. The range of movement is flexion 160, abduction 154, and the very good external rotation of average 30 degrees. Uh, constant score grading, good or excellent in 29 patients. And Oxford shoulder score, excellent in 28 patients, good in two patients. All patients were satisfied. Uh, there were no complication in terms of screw penetration or collapse or malunion or implant breakage. The plate removal was not routinely recommended with this system, but two patients requested plate removal and the plate was removed very easily at surgery. So an example of a 54-year-old man, a fracture dislocation, community greater tuberosity, large fragment is the initial part of the series. I decided to use it peak plate to fix it, and that's how it looks like. And uh, this is the 38-year-old man after road traffic accident, the four-part fracture. I could see the extent of combination on the uh, CT scan. And this was the fixation with uh, uh, CR peak plate, and that is the final follow-up x-rays. Uh, see, notice the amount of internal external rotation on both sides, nearly similar. A 42-year-old uh, gentleman with a road traffic accident uh, completely displaced the two-part fracture and is ideal indication for peak plate fixation, restoring the call curve, and this uh, came at three months follow-up. So uh, the, the results of a peak plate are comparable to other plate systems like stainless steel or titanium with least or no complications. The advantages of a CR peak plate, number one, is a variable angle system. So no longer the plate positioning is dictated, is dictating the position of screws or Colcord screws or subacromial impingement, you could vary the angle. And it is a locking plate. Uh, second is the biocompatible. Uh, it doesn't cause any metallosis or scar reaction, it's less reactive. Say our peak plate and peak is a material that has been extensively used in spine surgery as well as in uh, 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 anchor surgeries. So it is radiolucent plate. Uh, it is, allow, it is allowing us to do a very good intraoperative reduction and checking the accuracy, as well as monitor fracture healing in follow-up. If you do, for example, axillary lateral view, you could see the tuberosity position very clearly. The modulus of elasticity, look at this graph, the CR peak plate is closer to cortical bone. So if you look at it, it should be ideally used only for metaphyseal fracture, a P, the peak plate is not for shaft fracture. You should remember that. Uh, so uh, ideal implant for osteoporotic fracture because there will be less stress shielding. Mechanical advantage, uh, low wear rate has been uh, reported with peak plate compared to titanium as well. So additionally, it is MRI compatible. If you have a peak plate, 
it could have a, a MRA without causing much artifacts. And there is also no, absolutely no cold welding, and it is easy removal at uh, uh, revision if you need to do for uh, later replacement necessity. Uh, limitation of this study is retrospective nature and a small sample size, but we are having a long follow up as well. Uh, in conclusion, our results suggest that internal fixation with the CR peak locking plate system is a reliable and safe method of treating displaced proximal femoral fractures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ram, and you covered a whole lot of ground in excellent time. And Thank you. Let's make up two or three minutes of time. I'll summarize at the end, but uh, great presentation and Thank you for taking us, walking us through peak plate. So uh, now we'll go to the final and the exciting part of the presentation by uh, Professor Ravi Sauta from Gurgaon, Artemis Hospital. And he's going to walk us through some very interesting cases to apply what we've learned in the last few uh, talks. All yours, uh, Dr. Ravi. Yes, sir. Uh, can you see my screen, sir? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'll start with the uh, case presentation. Is a 26-year motor vehicular accident uh, presented with the <clears throat> proximal humerus fracture, and uh, was operated uh, presented to uh, in some other city. Uh, so uh, options are probably to do a conservative treatment, uh, percutaneous fixation, X fix up application with the threaded K wires or uh, filos. Uh, fixation with the uh, or augmented fixation and if uh, as discussed already that if the patient is elderly osteoporotic the one may uh, even uh, have to uh, go for uh, hemi or a reverse uh, as indicated uh, by previous speakers so uh, the orthopedic surgeon chose to uh, put in uh, multiple k wires and uh, then uh, uh, kept it in a pouch arm sling and uh, later on it uh, uh, went on to heal and uh, after the complete healing uh, the k wires were removed and uh, soon when physiotherapy was uh, advised for a stiff shoulder and sudden pop and pain uh, came in and uh, it was uh, uh, felt that uh, there is a refracture at the uh, previous site uh, where uh, it was uh, uh, already uh, uniting. Now the problem is uh, uh, whether it is a non-union or uh, it is a refracture at the weak uh, healing junction, which is uh, approximately about one and a half, uh, 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 about uh, three, uh, three months uh, from the index surgery. And... Uh, uh, this was the presentation back again, uh, patient reported back to the operating surgeon and uh, next, uh, what else, uh, if somebody wants to uh, take up the case, what are the options? Uh, Dr. Ram or Dr. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, basically, if you look at the original fracture configuration, it is a shaft fracture, it is a metaphysical fracture extending to the shaft. So to first of all, go back, uh, the ideal choice would be to have a plate and not only wires. The wire fixation is, uh, is a choice to treat a, a three part, four part, or a metaphyseal fracture, but not a fracture extending into the shaft. So I think the main problem is the fracture has not healed. The shaft fracture has not healed, it's just given up. Yeah, so. Now, at this scenario, the tuberosity seems to be uh, healing, but we don't not know how much is the rotation or whatever. But yeah. uh, this fracture needs now reduction, osteosynthesis, bone grafting, and a long uh, locking plate fixation in my uh, practice. Okay, uh, so this is what uh, uh, was done again uh, using the same principles, what you said. Uh, because of a long beak, there was uh, interfragmentary fixation, uh, reasonable fixation, little virus though, uh, but. Uh, this is what it uh, ended up. Any any comments? You should have a good lateral view. <laughs> uh, so, see, this patient uh, still not inherited by me and uh, okay, okay. Like, right. <laughs> were previously, uh, you know, uh, done elsewhere. So, uh, this is this is all I have. So it. Uh, 
actually what happened uh, it got a little bit of infection there and then uh, after some time the uh, the operating surgeon he removed the implant and uh, this is what uh, uh, was left uh, after about uh, six months of the second surgery any and uh, so implant was removed uh, at this point uh, so patient presented to us uh, uh, the in between x ray one of the x ray which was supposed to be uh, you know which uh, with which uh, which we did at our institute i am unable to really fetch that out basically uh, it was uh, showing uh, extensive uh, uh, osteoporosis kind of a thing or uh, osteopenia because of the uh, long uh, immobilization and uh, removal of the implant and the multiple surgeries which have been performed uh, however there was no uh, infection uh, at present and uh, his uh, cbc sr crp all were normal uh, and uh, because of the very previous surgeries uh, and mm -hmm. infection uh, now it is a frank non union presented with uh, no active infection at the present multiple surgeries young male right hand dominant uh, uh, shoulder very stiff just articular fracture uh, with a very atrophic uh, muscles uh, around the uh, around the area so what we did uh, in this particular case is uh, so so the options remain probably uh, as you rightly said that uh, open reduction bone grafting intramedullary fibular strut with the plate or a double plate uh, bone graft or uh, intramedullary nail with bone graft intramedullary nail plate uh, a combination uh, with bone graft and uh, what we opted for intramedullary fibular graft and a plate uh, 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 graft so uh, in this case uh, the technique of revival uh, uh, removal of uh, retrieval of the fibular strut uh, can be done uh, very easily uh one need to little bit uh, burr it out or uh, shape it uh, to fit in the medullary canal sometimes it does not fit into the medullary canal very easily and uh, one need to size it out uh, and uh, then uh, put it in position and uh, do a good uh, reasonable compression these are intraoperative uh, pictures if you have a facility for a allograft people have used the allograft fibula but uh, we usually do not have access to that so we use auto a uh, graft from the uh, patient's fibula and uh, these are the intra operative uh, pictures this is the intra operative image one can see the uh, fibular strut somewhere here somewhere in the middle uh, and uh, this is how uh, it looked after uh, uh, healing and uh, this is what uh, uh, it uh, was after about 8 uh, 11 months of uh, uh post operative uh, uh fixation excellent yeah i think that's a great comeback after a difficult situation with a implant failure and an infection so just illustrates the principles uh and uh, the importance of uh, biological augmentation in yes. cases where you have a combination of biological and mechanical failure nicely done uh, dr ravi aiman uh, dr aiman can i make a comment yes uh, i think uh, this x ray uh, what uh, professor uh, sauta showed is illustrates a very fantastic principle what he did was you know the one of the best choice but it shows that and what ram where ram started you see in the it is minimally invasive fixations you know picking the making people like bish, bish pitama okay poking the wire from all corner you do it only when you are very sure that it's going to unite and you're going to remove it by 6 to 8 weeks see that those two wires which started from gt and went all the way down into the shaft medullary okay the medullary wires okay they they limit the abduction for a very long time right and most of the time and when this was extending into the shaft where the deltoid is going to insert it is going to go in abduction so these minimally invasive we have seen a lot lot many times that eventually these wire tracks becomes a big problem they go for infection even if you do plating that itself is a big mess there's a likelihood that when you do plating it's going to get infected 
so i think the message should be what not to do doing this is a great job what boss did but i think it should be very clear that what is the limitation of these k wire fixation who is your patient who should be you know undergoing this k wire fixation and not everywhere where people just poke those wires yeah, absolutely agree absolutely so uh, dr amen is there is there a time for another uh... unfortunately dr ravi we are uh, almost out of time all right so no, i'll no, just uh, take a summarize problem. all the learning that we've had during this uh, nice session on proximal humerus fractures so basically started off by emphasizing that uh, proximal humerus fractures are basically osteoporotic fractures low energy trauma with patients with osteopenia and sarcopenia and dr sushal set the stage by talking about the version the muscular forces and emphasize the value of ct scan in contemporary orthopedics for diagnosis uh, he also mentioned that the knee's classification has stood the test of time and that's the one which defines the displacement of the fragments and that's what we use uh, dr lokesh spoke about the importance of uh, biological preserving surgery and described in detail several close reduction maneuvers very often multiple maneuvers to achieve a multiplanar reduction and importantly as dr vivek mentioned later he emphasized which fractures you should do it in and which fractures you shouldn't do it in because it's important that it's not a panacea for all the fractures and certainly you don't want to attempt it for a head splitting fracture dr vivek pande gave a nice overview about uh, and you also record from your side also na yeah okay yeah manish sir you start your recording also okay record with the computer are you can see the slide has started on the laptop yeah Let please play uh, just maximize it okay. uh very good evening today we are going to organize a webinar from delhi orthopedics pg training on behalf of ortho tv this is dr sansaloda welcome to ortho uh, online education webinar from ortho tv we would like to thank all of our faculty for sharing their knowledge and uh, we wish you a safe and healthy uh, lockdown period we wish all our audience and healthy and safe days ahead and we hope all these webinars add value to your time these webinars are dependent on internet speed it might be at times unstable please bear with us for any issues on the internet today we have a uh, academic dance from uh, uh the, the zadist people nicoxia people so they making this uh, uh, nicoxia nicoxia mr nicoxia mr 8 plus 120 pnsp so now i hand over to manish dhawan sir to start the webinar good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, doa pg training program and uh, this uh, today's webinar is on peripheral nerve injuries it's a very very you know uh, popular program in ortho tv and a uh, lot of requests were there to have this webinar so i welcome uh, dr anil dhal uh, uh, dr kotwal dr pankaj jindal dr vinit dabas and dr ajit uh, shankaran i also thank uh, uh, i also thank dr uh, ashok sham dr shamshul hoda dr ravi chohan uh, for the technical support and i now request dr uh, sharad agarwal president doa to please uh, introduce dr dhal uh, and uh, then dr dhal will introduce the other faculty dr sharad agarwal please thank you dr manish good afternoon friends i welcome you all to the post graduate teaching program of delhi orthopedic association today's theme is peripheral nerve injuries many thanks to professor anil dhawan dhal and the whole eminent faculty for preparing and participating in this webinar today the subject of peripheral nerve injury is not only important for post graduates every orthopedic surgeon has to face this challenge frequently whenever uh, uh, managing trauma or joint replacement even any other electrical work elect electric work all in all is this webinar shall be great learning revision and update for all of us my special thanks to dr manish dr shamshul dhuda dr sham for working hard behind the doors to make doa webinars a huge success it's my pleasure to introduce professor anil dhawan 
who is instrumental in organizing today's webinar, though I'm sure he needs no introduction. He's an eminent orthopedic surgeon of Delhi and a hugely respected teacher. Presently, he's professor of orthopedics at uh, ESIC Medical College, Faridabad. Previously, he was director and professor and head of the department of orthopedics at Maulana Medical College, New Delhi. Uh, also, previously, he was head of orthopedics University of Delhi, had been a member of the Ethics Committee of Medical Council of India. He had been past chairman, Animal Ethics Committee, Maulana Zad Medical College, New Delhi, and past chairman of Hand Cells Action of IUA. Now I request Dr. Anil Dhal to proceed further, uh, the, take the proceedings first. Dr. Dhal, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, please allow me to share the screen. Uh, Somebody has to give me permission to access. Dr. Ravi? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you give him permission.